ASRock B550 Extreme 4. What exactly do you get for your £190? It's a socket AM4 motherboard B550 chipset, just as the name suggests. So it supports your Ryzen 3000 processors and your new Ryzen 5000 processors. And apparently if you can find one a Ryzen 4000 APU and you get a handful of accessories, such as some SATA cables, you get a user guide and you get whatever the heck this thing is. I've literally no idea what this round thing is. I, I don't know. Or put it another way, how about we have drivers in future on flash drives? Wouldn't that just be better and so cheap? The motherboard has a decent list of features. We've got 14 phase VRMs. We've got DDR4 memory support up to 4733 megahertz. Obviously that's overclocking. The primary graphics slot and primary M.2 are PCI Express Gen 4. The other M.2 and the other expansion slots are Gen 3 because they're controlled by the chipset and that is the difference between B550 and X570. On the plus side, no active cooling on the chipset. We're talking passive cooling, therefore you can expect, in terms of the motherboard, silent operation. And the other ports and connectors also look good. We've got a whole host of fan connectors around the periphery of the board, just where you expect to find them. We've got USB 3.1 Type A and also USB 3.1 Type C along the foot of the board. We've got USB 2.0s, micro buttons for power and reset, postcode debug. We've got support for 12 volt RGB and also addressable RGB. The Connectors for the EPS, you can get to them, access is perfectly decent. Turning to the rear I.O. panel, we have an HDMI 2.1, so if you're running with integrated graphics, you have the connector to suit. We've got two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A's. Surprisingly, we have a legacy PS2 port, but as we know, overclockers prefer PS2 because it doesn't break ever unlike USB can sometimes. We have four USB 2.0s, one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A, and a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C. Then we come to the Realtek 2.5G Ethernet. Next to the Ethernet, we have two holes and markings on the rear IO where clearly some models have Wi-Fi. And then we've got the surround sound audio. It so happens that the middle M.2 is designated for Wi-Fi. So if you want to add Wi-Fi to this board, that's where the card goes. But of course, you don't have any rear panel antennae for that. I'm gonna tear off all the furniture and then we can take a closer look at the components. Primary M.2 cover. and the secondary M.2 and also the chipset cooler located with a peg on the chipset heatsink and there we have the secondary M.2 this piece of plastic doesn't do anything significant let's just take it off just to demonstrate that bio shield shroud two parts and we have there an RGB cable. And that properly reveals the heat sinks on the VRMs. Nice and easy. VRM heat sinks have a decent amount of surface area. They're reasonably hefty pieces of aluminium uh, extruded by the look of them and they have these channels passing through so while they're not finned they do have a decent amount of surface area. They look like nice pieces of work. The VRM controller is a Renesas RAA229004, which is an eight phase VRM controller. And then we have the 14 phases that are controlled by the eight phase controller. And they are 
12 Vishe SIC 654s, which are 50 amp Dr. Mosses for the V core, so up the side there and two there. And then we have these two for the SOC, which are Vishay SIC 654A, also 50 amp Dr. Moss. However, they're 3.3 volt PWM, whereas these are all 5 volt PWM. And this configuration works thanks to these doublers on the back. So the six doublers work in conjunction with the 12 VRMs. So six plus two equals 14. Here's our test PC. The processor is an AMD Ryzen 9 3900X. CPU cooler is a fractal design Celsius S36, which is a 360mm all-in-one made by Acetech. Memory, 32GB of Corsair DDR4 Vengeance LPX running at 3600MHz. The M.2 SSD is unusual. It's by Team Group. It's their T-Force Cardera Liquid. Graphics card by Gigabyte is an RTX 2080 Super. Power is provided by Seasonic with a Prime Platinum 1300 watt power supply. All right then, let's take a look at the BIOS. Memory defaults to 2133. XMP looks fine. Load line calibration, you get the graph which shows you whether one is at the top or the bottom. 12 cores running 3848. Hmm, interesting. RGB LED is set by default to rainbow. Let's change that to static. Oh, we have to punch in a number. And that's white. So the CPU fan is separate to the rest of the fans. In fan configuration, CPU 2 can also do a water pump. Chassis fan 1 can do a water pump. Chassis fan 2 can do a water pump. Chassis fan 3 can do a water pump. And 4. And 5. Wow, loads of high powered fan connectors. All looks absolutely fine. And we go into Windows and what's this Dragon software all about? It's monitoring our 2.5G network connection. Hmm, can we prevent it running at startup? No, we can't because apparently it doesn't exist. Well, that's annoying. What other software do we have? We have ASRock Polychrome Sync, which is RGB control and does pretty much what we expect. We've got a bunch of presets, we've got a color wheel, and we can do sliders for the RGB channels. And we can, depending on the pattern, also adjust the speed, which is all absolutely fine. And then we have ASRock A tuning. OC Tweaker gives us the option of changing a bunch of the settings you'll find in the BIOS, CPU speed, base clock, and the voltages. Can't see load line calibration there. System info, much the same as every other monitoring utility you might find. Fantastic tuning, ho-ho play on words, so you can adjust your fan curves without going into the BIOS. Right, let's see how this motherboard behaves. We're running Blender. The CPU temperature's at 62, 63 degrees, which sounds about right. What's the motherboard doing? What are the VRM temperatures? We don't know. We've got some bizarre auxiliary figures here. 13, 31, 15. Well, 13 and 15 are below ambient. Auxiliary 8, also below ambient. Uh, don't understand that at all. The CPU is absolutely happy. It's running at 4.05 gigahertz, exactly as we expect from a Ryzen 9 3900X. But what the VRMs are doing is something of a mystery. 
if ASRock's not going to provide sensors that HW Info can understand, then I'm going to have to provide a data logger and some thermocouples. Thermocouples secured in position with bits of masking tape. These are all V-Core VRMs. These two are V-Core, these two are SOC. So I'm monitoring three of the V-Core, one of the two SOCs. Heat sinks reinstalled, thermocouples secured in position. With the data logging connected up, we're now in a position to find out what the ASRock VRMs are doing when the system's under load. Running Blender Classroom, the CPU's running at about 4.05 gigahertz all cores. CPU package power 142 watts, which is exactly what we expect to see. VRMs on the top of the configuration, uh, the one for the SOC and one of the V cores on the top, 35 degrees, rising to 36. VRMs on the side for V core, just about to hit 40 degrees. Uh, system's only running for a short time. These temperatures are certainly going to rise. Let's just do a quick uh, infrared reading. Heatsink on the side, 37 degrees. Heatsink on the top, 34 degrees. So infrared reading of the heat sinks is only about two degrees different from the VRM temperatures themselves. Quite surprised by that. I thought it'd be way different. I'm gonna let Blender complete and rerun it a few times to get the temperatures up a bit. I'll return to this shortly. After a few cycles of Blender, ignore these dips, that's where each Blender run restarts. You can see the VRMs at the top are at 40 Celsius and the VRMs at the side are at 47 Celsius. I'm quite surprised that the infrared reading of the heat sinks themselves is only out to the tune of 1 degree on the top heat sink and three degrees on the side heat sink. So an infrared reading of the heat sinks themselves is actually a fairly good way of seeing what's going on beneath. Nonetheless, we can say without any fear of contradiction, these VRM temperatures, lovely and low. We've seen how the VRMs behave on auto with all cores running at 4.05 gigahertz. And now it's time to do a really simple overclock. We're gonna raise the multiplier to 42 for a clock speed of 4.2 gigahertz fix the V core at 1.25 V and raise LLC. Just that, nothing more. And now it's time to run Blender once again. It turns out that overclocking this processor with 1.25 V core is actually under vaulting. CPU power draw has reduced from 142 watts to 134 watts, a small decrease of eight watts. The consequence is the VRMs have barely changed at all. Nominally, the V-Core VRMs have increased by 2 degrees Celsius from 47 to 49. In the great scheme of things, everything is static. It's time to be a little bit brutal. So in the BIOS, we raise the V-Core from 1.25 volts to 1.35 volts, leaving the clock speed at 4.2 gigahertz. This is entirely unnecessary. It's the sort of thing you do when you're being a bit clumsy overclocking, and it's simply going to stick more power into the CPU. In Blender, we can see the VRMs responding ever so slightly. Temperature has increased again for the V-Core VRMs up to 52 degrees. So originally 47, then 49 at 1.25 V-Core, and now 52. The VRMs at the top of the configuration have also increased slightly to 44 degrees. So unless I do something absolutely mental, the VRMs on the ASRock are completely under control and running practically chilled. What's the word on performance? Does the ASRock B550 Extreme 4 deliver? Well, of course it does if you use the correct hardware. In this case, 12 cores of Ryzen 9 3900X is always going to deliver. I've got a PCI Express Gen 4 graphics slot and I've got an RTX 2080 Super Graphics card in that slot. Also, when it comes to overclocking, I could certainly have pushed this processor past 4.2 gigahertz, certainly 4.25, maybe 4.3, not sure about 4.3. My personal preference, however, is to run on auto with Ryzen or maybe use PBO. I'm uh, going to be very keen uh, when I get my mitts on a uh, Ryzen 5000 to use PBO2 when that comes along. That sounds interesting, but right now that's not a thing. That's a thing for the future. The features are good. We don't have integrated Wi-Fi. I did install uh, an M.2 Wi-Fi card in that middle M.2 slot. Out here the Wi-Fi connection is not brilliant, but it is tolerable. 
and the M.2 couldn't connect. It's the lack of external antennae that does that. The thumb drive in a USB port on the rear I.O connected to the Wi-Fi without difficulty. So essentially that M.2 for Wi-Fi, I suggest you ignore it. Think of this as a motherboard that supports one primary M.2 SSD with a secondary slot if you want more storage, one graphics card, all the features that you want, RGB and such like, loads of USB, including Type-C. It's a good board. The BIOS does everything I want. The software is okay. Pricing, it's £190. For £190 you can get a great many other boards. Uh, it's basically head-to-head -head with uh, various of the ASUS B550 boards. It's also more expensive than the MSI Tomahawk and that's slightly problematic. I haven't played with the Tomahawk myself. Uh, Luke did that review. Luke hasn't reviewed this board, doesn't have direct experience of it, so we've kind of had to work remotely on this one. Personally, I'd be inclined to lean towards the ASRock rather than the Tomahawk, but there's not a lot in it, really there isn't, and the pricing definitely tells against ASRock. However, it's a good board, and if it's a bit cheaper, I'd have no trouble whatsoever recommending it. As things stand, it's a little expensive, it's not the end of the world, but it means this is a, an 8 out of 10. In other words, I'm happy with it, but if it was cheaper, I'd be really happy with it. If I haven't already said it, make sure you hit the subscribe button, ring that bell, and return to read more of our reviews and to watch our videos. I'm Leo Water for Kit Guru. This is the ASRock B550 Extreme 4.